white, prophet, plagiarist, or worse. Alan Gold Harmon was born 26th of November, 1827, and passed away 16th of July, 1915, at 88 years old. If you're watching this presentation, you may or may not understand the history of the great controversy concerning Ellen Gold White, and that is the liable charge that she plagiarized her works from other authors without securing their permission. But before we proceed any further, let us ascertain the definition of plagiarism. Plagiarism is defined as the representation of another author's language, thoughts, ideas, or expressions as one's own original work. In educational contexts, there are differing definitions of plagiarism depending on the institution. Plagiarism is considered a violation of academic integrity and a breach of journalistic ethic. Someone who uses another person's words or ideas as if they were his own. Synonyms are literary pirate, pirate, plagiarizer, type of a stealer, thief, a criminal who takes property belonging to someone else with the intention of keeping it or selling it. Jeremiah 23, verse 30 to 32. So, I am against the prophets, says Yahuwah, who steal my words from each author. Yes, I am against the prophets, says Yahuwah, who speak their own words. Then add, he says, I am against those who concoct prophecies out of fake dreams, says Yahuwah. They tell them, and by their lies and arrogance, they lead my people astray. I didn't send them. I didn't commission them. And they don't do this people any good at all, says Yahuwah. Jeremiah 23, 30-32 A few biblical truths, some immutable facts of Scripture that we need to be very clear on as we ensue into this rather revealing and shocking investigation is first and foremost, a true prophet is not going to make a mistake, not going to lie, not going to alter or recant a prophecy after it is made, as Yahuwah is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33 Nor is it possible for Yah to lie. Numbers 23 verse 19 and Titus chapter 1 verse 2 Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father who made the heavenly lights. With him there is neither variation nor darkness caused by turning. James 1.17 Yeshua the Messiah is the same yesterday today and forever, Hebrews 13, verse 8. I will not profane my covenant or change what my lips have spoken, Psalms 89, verse 35. So Yah does not change. Furthermore, a true prophet would know his name. His name is certainly not Jehovah or Jesus. Every prophet of the Bible knew his name. Why is it we find in the case of Ellen White, she is oblivious to the true names of the Father and the Son? But I digress, or am I? For it is a sign of the prophet as to whether the truth is in them or not. And before the end of this investigation, you will have answered that question for yourself. I have heard what these prophets prophesying lies in my name are saying. I've had a dream. I've had a dream. How long will this go on? Is my word in the hearts of these prophets who are prophesying lies, who are prophesying the deceit of their own words, with their dreams that they keep telling each other, they hope to cause my people to forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name when they worshiped Baal. When I was a kid, there was a great and very real sense of the father of creation imminently coming. It seemed as though everyone was a Christian. 
When there's worship in the park, you know it must be something. When you see all your neighbors there, even your school teacher is there worshiping Jesus as we know him then. Praise Yah, hallelujah. That freeing sense of feeling that we're all finally the majority and no longer the minority. No longer dwelling in obscurity, having to restrain our beliefs, but now we are free to be most audible about them. There was a real sense of righteousness and a godly fear hung in the air. It felt wonderful. The Most High Yahuwah seemed everywhere. Even though we only knew him as Jesus at the time and Jehovah, we worshipped him in the simple yet innocent place of ignorance. In his time, he would free me and bring me to a place where I, along with many, would soon begin to worship him in spirit and in truth. But that would be some years later on. In those glory days, Yah seemed to permeate my entire life, and none more so than the national televising of the legendary performance of Robert Powell in Franco Zifarelli's 1977 Jesus of Nazareth, which incidentally aired over my birthday for a number of weeks during the feast of Passover, also known as Esach, also known as Easter. People were mesmerized to their television screens, and it seemed as though the fear of Yah gripped the world. Well, so it seemed to me at least. Then came the Billy Graham Crusades to my very town, which felt as though they drew almost the entire city. Even secular legends were seen almost right at my very doorstep, Sir Cliff Richard and others all appearing on stage, leading rallies and calls to salvation in none other than Jesus Christ. Everywhere I turned, I was surrounded by my convictions that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and I certainly wanted this gift of eternal life with God. Neither this world nor hell were any part of my life's equations. The world then was a very different place. I say this with much sadness in my heart, as I really believe then that Christ's return was truly imminent in the way that people were turning to him with everything they had. The reason I'm sharing with you my life story as a youth is to help the viewer to better understand the early life of Ellen Gold White. To truly appreciate her background, upbringing, and early religious experience, one must first understand the culture and the time she was born into. The environment was one of extreme religious fervor, born into a culture very different from today's irreverent charismatic church era. The fear of God was in the very air she breathed. People were far more concerned about the afterlife and their salvation, something today few people give any thought to. Our journey begins with the Millerites, a movement led by the teachings of William Miller, who in 1831 first shared publicly his belief in the second advent of Jesus Christ, and how he believed this would occur in roughly the year 1843 to 1844. William Miller thrived during a period in history known as the Second Great Awakening. His beliefs were taken as predictions. They spread wildly and were believed by a great many people around the entire world. This prediction would eventually prove to be false and is recorded in the annals of history as the Great Disappointment. In March 1840, William Miller visited Portland, Maine and gave a course of lectures on the Second Coming of Christ. These lectures produced a great sensation and the Christian church on Casco Street, where the discourses were given, were crowded day and night. No wild excitement attended the meetings, but a deep solemnity pervaded the minds of those who heard. Not only was a great interest manifested in the city, but the entire country. People flocked in day after day, bringing their lunch baskets and remaining from morning until the close of the evening meeting. At just 13 years of age, Ellen White would recount her memory of this momentous event. In company with my friends, I attended these meetings. Mr. Miller traced down the prophecies with an exactness that struck conviction to the hearts of his hearers. He dwelt upon the prophetic periods and brought many proofs to strengthen his position. 
Then his solemn and powerful appeals and admonitions to those who were unprepared held the crowds as if spellbound. Miller was a prosperous farmer, a Baptist lay preacher and student of the Bible, living in northeastern New York. He spent years of intensive study of symbolic meaning of the prophecies of Daniel, especially Daniel 8.14, 2,300 day prophecy, then the cleansing of the sanctuary. Miller believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary represented the earth's destruction by fire at Christ's second coming. Using the year-day method of prophetic interpretation, Miller became convinced that the 2,300-day period started at 457 BC with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem at Artaxerxes I of Persia. His simple calculation then indicated that this period would end about 1843. BC Ezra chapter 7 verses 12 through 19. In September 1822, Miller formally stated his conclusions in a 20-point document, including Article 15. I quote, I believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ is near, even at the door, even within 21 years, on or before 1843. Close quote. This document remained private many years. Miller merely added Daniel's 2300-day prophecy, day for a year, in chapter 8, to the date of 457 BC, and presumptuously contrived that Messiah would return to fulfill the 70-week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. It was during this religious fervor that spread like wildfire across the world during what is known as the Second Great Awakening that the Adventist Church was birthed. Historians named the Second Great Awakening in the context of the First Great Awakening of the 1730s and 1750s, and of the Third Great Awakening of the later 1850s and early 1900s. The Second and Third Awakenings were part of a much larger Romantic religious movement that was sweeping across England, Scotland, and Germany. New religious movements emerged during the Second Great Awakening, such as Adventism, dispensationalism, and the Latter-day Saint movement. The belief that the return of the Messiah of God Most High was imminent and the words, people get ready, were more than the bait of a catchy song. People busied themselves preparing for the return of Jesus Christ to judge the world in righteousness for its sins. Ellen White was born in the time of the great tent meetings and religious revival could be tasted in the very air. William Miller's preaching of the 1843 and later the 1844 date for the Second Coming reached the ears of more than just the followers of his movement. After further discussion and study, Miller briefly adopted a new date, April 18, 1844, one based on the Karaite Jewish calendar as opposed to the rabbinic calendar. Like the previous date, April 18 passed without Christ's return. In the Advent Herald of April 24, Joshua Himes wrote that all the, quote, expected and published time, close quote, had passed and admitted that they had been, quote, mistaken in the precise time of the termination of the prophetic period, close quote. Josiah Litch surmised that the Adventists were probably, quote, only in error relative to the event which marked its close, Close quote. Miller published a letter to Second Advent believers, writing, I confess my error and acknowledge my disappointment, yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. In August 1844, at a camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire, Samuel S. Snow presented a new interpretation, which became known as the Seventh Month Message, or the True Midnight Cry. In a complex discussion based on scriptural typology, Snow presented his conclusion, still based on the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel 8.14, that Christ would return on the 10th day of the 7th month of the present year, that being 1844, using the calendar of the Karamite Jews. He determined his date to be October 22, 1844. This seventh month message spread with a rapidity unparalleled in the Millerites' experience amongst this general population. Indeed, with such fiery preaching 
and convincing displays of an ecstatic and revelatory comprehension of biblical prophecy, it is understandable how great this great disappointment would be to the hearts of the faithful. Henry Emmons, member of the Millerite movement, had this to say, I waited all Tuesday, and dear Jesus did not come. I waited all the forenoon of Wednesday, and was well in body as I ever was. But after 12 o'clock, I began to feel faint, and before dark, I needed someone to help me up to my chamber, as my natural strength was leaving me very fast. And I lay prostrate for two days without any pain, sick with disappointment. Ellen White, then an early Millerite, would eventually rise to fame as she defended William Miller's interpretation. She would state, and I quote, that the door of probation would close on all who refuted his prophecy. Ellen White wrote positively about William Miller in The Great Controversy and elsewhere. She accepted his teachings, going through the great disappointment at age 16. She believed that his preaching fulfilled the prophecies of scripture and saw him being guided by the Most High. I saw that William Miller erred as he was soon to enter the heavenly Canaan. In suffering his influence to go against the truth, others led him to this. Others must account for it. But angels watch the precious dust of this servant of God, and he will come forth at the sound of the last trump. Early Writings, page 258. E.G.W. on William Miller and the Great Disappointment. Little did I realize when after writing an article on the origin of the Nephilim in the 90s and creating no small storm for my revelations as my biblical findings completely contradicted the writings and views of the venerated prophetess of the Adventist church, how could I compete with such a pillar of the church? It would be a kind and studious Adventist church brother who directed me to search out an author by the name of Walter T. Ray and his book, The White Lie. Little did I know at the time that Yahuwah was answering my cries for help and arming me with the ammunition I would need to stave off the assault that was about to come my way. I owe a great debt of gratitude to the incredible work of Pastor Walter T. Ray, who presided on the board of the world-famous Adventist Loma Linda University and Seminary. The gratitude is for his legacy to all Adventists for his incomparable work. Thank you, Pastor Walter T. Ray, for all you have done for Adventists and the legacy you have left so all men will know the truth, even if there are those who desire for the truth never to come to light. Another book I'd encourage you to take a look at is Pastor Billy Crone's book on world religions, cults, and the occult. And this book specifically looks at Seventh-day Adventism and the false prophecies of Ellen G. White. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shun him. Arabic saying, author unknown. At age nine, Ellen Harmon was struck in the head by a stone thrown by a classmate. Ellen spent three weeks unconscious and seriously disfigured. It was during this time she became concerned as to her salvation and the place called hell. At age 18, Ellen Gold Harmon would meet James Springer White and the two would be married the following year, approximately 1846. The early founders of the Advent movement consisted of William Miller, Uriah Smith, Jane Andrew, Joseph Bates, John Byington, James Springer White, and Ellen Gold Harmon White. They would be the founders of this movement, which would later become the Seventh-day Adventist movement. James and Ellen White had four boys born within the family, Henry Nichols, 1847 to 1863 was their firstborn. He died of pneumonia at the age of 16. James Edson, 1844 to 1928, became a Seventh-day Adventist minister and is most remembered for his pioneering evangelistic and educational work among African-Americans in the Southern United States. William Clarence, 1854 to 1937, also became a Seventh-day Adventist minister. After James's death in 1881, William became his mother's chief editorial assistant and publishing manager. To this very day, she remains one of the most published Christian authors of all time, with over 5,000 periodic articles, over 40 published books. As of 2019, over 200 white titles are published, over 100,000 pages of manuscripts, thousands of articles and press releases, 
She's credited with over 25 million words. Amazing. An amazing accomplishment for any author, not just within Christianity. So if Ellen White's visions were from God, we need to ask why subsequent visions contradicted her first vision. If God commissioned her to speak his words, and if he put the words in her mouth, we also need to ask why did she need to plagiarize or paraphrase other writers of her day? From 1844 to 1863, White allegedly experienced between 100 and 200 visions, typically in public places and meeting halls. She claimed to have reached over 2,000 prophetic dreams and visions between 1844 and 1909, which formed the basis of her personal testimonies, sermons, articles, and books. Ellen White clearly stated that her visions and her writings were from the Lord and not her own ideas or opinions. In the interest of time and keeping this investigation as factual and concise as possible, I will limit my evidences of Ellen White's false prophecies to just three examples. Indeed, my commitments do not permit me to produce the voluminous set of teachings it would take to truly unveil the extensive magnitude of her false claims. Ellen G. White had been verified and proven to be disingenuous by the very church she helped to found. The question stands before us, can a prophet of God deny what she or he claimed to be a vision from God himself? The first prophecy that we need to take a look at of Ellen White's is the shut door of 1844. While praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell on me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, look again, and look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path, cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was on the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the first end of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so they might not stumble. And if they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But soon some grew weary, and they said the city was a great way off, and they expected to have entered it before. No doubt the bright light behind them was Ellen Gold White, and the light also known as the midnight cry. Jesus was the light before, not behind them. He leads, she follows behind. Hence why within Adventism, there is constantly the reference of the greater light, and Ellen G. White being the lesser light. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm, and from his arm came a glorious light which waved over the Advent band, and they shouted, Hallelujah! Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and got their eyes off the mark and lost sight of Jesus and fell off the path down in the dark and wicked world below. It was just as impossible for them to get on the path again and go to the city as all the wicked world which God had rejected. They fell all the way along the path, one after another, until we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus coming. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice, while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. When God spake the time, he poured on us the Holy Ghost, and our faces began to light up and shine with the glory of God as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai. Ellen White at this point firmly believed the door to salvation was shut. There is no question of her belief in the shut door doctrine from 1844 until 1851. Yet this visionary would later deny she held to this cultic position. Subsequent visions clearly confirm her belief in the shut door doctrine. It was only after 1851 that her position modified. 
I feel it important to note that O.R.L. Crossier, an early Millerite founder, first invented the investigative judgment concept, but afterward, he himself repudiated it. Ellen White prophesied that old Jerusalem would never be built up. I was pointed to some who are in the great error of believing that it is their duty to go to old Jerusalem and think they have a work to do there before the Lord comes. I saw that Satan had greatly deceived some in this thing. I also saw that old Jerusalem never would be built up and that Satan was doing his utmost to lead the minds of the children of the Lord into these things now in the gathering time. If we look at modern Jerusalem to this very day, is there really any need for any further commentary on that prophecy? Ellen White prophesied that the door to salvation and grace had been shut in 1844. At the time I had the vision of the midnight cry, I had given it up in the past and thought it future, as also most of the band had. After I had the vision and God gave me light, he bade me deliver it to the band. But I shrank from it. I was young and I thought they would not receive it from me. The view about the bridegroom's coming I had about the middle of February 1845. While in Exeter, Maine, in meeting with Israel Damon, James, and many others, many of them did not believe in the shut door. I suffered much at the commencement of the meeting. Unbelief seemed to be on every hand. The Lord worked in mighty power, setting the truth home to their hearts. Most of them received the vision and were settled upon the shut door. Ellen White's African Bushman prophecies also caused her another great controversy of her own. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3 and 4, pages 64 and 75. But if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast, which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. Every species of animal which God had created were preserved in the ark. The confused species which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of men. Ellen White here is implying that the Bush peoples of many indigenous peoples of many countries such as Africa and the Aborigines, um, people of color are the end product of a sinful um, amalgamation between man and beast and that these species still exist today in certain races of men. And this is what caused the flood and this was an abomination of sorts. And this is to be found in Ellen White's writings. This amalgamation defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. These writings, as well as many others by Ellen White, were found to be unacceptable in the day. There were people that did express uh, their distaste of this prophecy of hers, but it still remained in her writings. Are you a prophetess? Tell us plainly. Early in my youth, I was asked several times, are you a prophet? I have never responded. I am the Lord's messenger. I know that many have called me a prophet, but I have made no claim to this title. My savior declared me to be his messenger. Your work, he instructed me, is to bear my word. Strange things will arise, and in your mouth I set you apart to bear the message to the erring ones, to carry the word before unbelievers, and with pen and voice to reprove from the word actions that are not right. Exhort from the word, I will make my word open to you. It shall not be as a strange language, in the true eloquence of simplicity, with voice and pen. The messages that I give shall be heard from one who has never learned in the schools. My spirit and my power shall be with you. Letter 55, 1905, quoted in Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 35 to 36. So, 
She's more than a prophet. Quote, Why have I not claimed to be a prophet? Because in these days, many who boldly claim that they are prophets are a reproach to the cause of Christ. And because my work includes much more than the word prophet signifies. Letter 55, 1905, quoting the Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 35 and 36. The third prophecy that I bring to your attention that Ellen White grossly erred on is Genesis chapter 6, the rise of the Nephilim. Let's see what the Bible has to say. In time, when men began to multiply on earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, a term called in the Hebrew Benai Elohim, saw that daughters of men were attractive and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Yahuwah said, My spirit will not live in human beings forever, for they too are flesh. Therefore, their lifespan is to be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God, the Benai Elohim, came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the ancient heroes, men of renown. Genesis 6, 1-4 This is known amongst Adventist circles as the Sethite theory. It was a proposal that it was the obedient sons of God on the mountain who had intercourse with the disobedient daughters of Cain. That is not a stance that is held and supported by the Bible, nor does history support it, nor does the archaeological record support that theory. Ellen White's stance was as such. We also have the prophetic gift of Ellen White confirming that Genesis 6-4 indicates that the godly line of Seth intermarried with the ungodly line of Cain. Notwithstanding the prevailing iniquity, there was a line of holy men who elevated and ennobled by communion with God, lived as in the companionship of heaven. They were men of massive intellect, of wonderful attainments. They had a great and holy mission to develop a character of righteousness, to teach a lesson of godliness not only to the men of their time, but for future generations. For some time, the two classes remained separate. The race of Cain, spreading from the place of their first settlement, dispersed over the plains and valleys where the children of Seth had dwelt, and the latter, in order to escape from their contaminating influence, withdrew to the mountains, and there made their home. So long as this separation continued, they maintained the worship of God in its purity, but in the lapse of time, they ventured, little by little, to mingle with the inhabitants of the valleys. This association was productive of the worst results. The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. The children of Seth, attracted by the beauty of the daughters of Cain's descendants, displeased the Lord by intermarrying with them. Many of the worshippers of God were beguiled into sin by the allurements that were now constantly before them and they lost their peculiar holy character. Mingling with the depraved, they became like them in spirit and in deeds. The restrictions of the seventh commandment were disregarded, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Sin spread abroad in the earth like a deadly leprosy. Pastor Walter T. Ray, former member of the Academic Board of Loma Linda Adventist Seminary and author of The White Lie, his accurate and factual record of the findings of esteemed Adventists that served the church and what they died wanting to be uncovered and made public to the church so the world would know the truth is laid bare in this book. And the purpose of this presentation is to share much of the important content from his book. Arthur Grosvenor Daniels, Seventh-day Adventist General Conference President, 1901 to 1922. As well as being an early Adventist pioneer, he established the first Seventh-day Adventist church in New Zealand at Ponsonby. While there, he served as president of the New Zealand Conference, 1889-1891, and of the Australia Conference. Arthur is most notably the longest serving president of the General Conference at that time. He was called to New Zealand and was one of the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist church in the South Pacific. Daniels had astounding success through his dynamic preaching 
In October 15, 1887, he opened the first Seventh-day Adventist Church in New Zealand at Ponsonby. While there, he served as president of the New Zealand Conference and of the Australia Conference. Later, he became the president of the Australian Union Conference before becoming president of the General Conference in 1901 and served as president until 1922, age 112. Time and again, those including the church's clan plan rushed to judgment to save Ellen, binding themselves to paraphrase or loose usage in her adaptions of others' material. Thus, they contributed to keeping alive the white lie. There were those of her contemporaries, however, who saw what was going on when Ellen and her group were burning the midnight oil far into the morning hours. Arthur G. Daniels, General Conference President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when called on to explain those northern lights that often lit up others' material, gave some justification of the problem at the 1919 Bible Conference at which efforts were made to come to grips with Ellen's writings. Like so many of the clan members who still wanted to work for the system, he took the high road in his explanation. Yes, and now take that life of Paul. I suppose you all know about it and knew what claims were put up against her. Charges made of plagiarism, even by the authors of the book. Coney Bear and Horson, and were liable to make the denomination trouble because there was so much of their book put into the life of Paul without any credit or quotation marks. Some people of strict logic might fly the track on that ground, but I am not built that way. I found it out, and I read it with Brother Palmer when he found it, and we got Coney Bear and Horson, and we got Wiley's history of the Reformation, and we read word for word, page after page, and no quotations, no credit. I really did not know the difference until I began to compare them. I supposed it was Sister White's own work. The poor sister said, quote, why, I didn't know about quotations and credits. My secretary should have looked after that, and the publishing house should have looked after it, close quote. Between 1901 and 1922, proof the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference president knew what was going on. The original book, The Life and the Epistles of St. Paul, published 1852, author William Daniel Coney Bear, a geologist and clergyman not of the SDA church, lived in London. And in G. White's offering and iteration was called Sketches from the Life of Paul, published in 1883. Pastor Walter Ray, while a pastor at the SDA Crest Memorial Church, Florida, named after celebrated doctors Daniel and Loretta Crest, pioneers in the Adventist medical work, gave Walter an old book, Sketches from the Life of Paul by Ellen White, for him to digest. Bruce Weaver, a young seminary student, upon discovering Walter Ray's research, copied it from the library and returned it. He was dismissed from the SDA seminary and from the ministry for copying the information. What was so damning about the information was it contained letters that Walter Ray had come into possession of that proved that Arthur White and the White estate knew of Ray's discoveries of Ellen White's intense plagiarism and that they called it the Ray Problem. I was given a book from the Magan Library, Elisha the Prophet, by Alfred Edishay. On the flyleaf was Ellen White's signature. By now, because of my constant use of Ellen White's books, I had become so familiar with them that I readily recognized similarities of wording and thought as I examined Edishay's book. Still later on, while I was studying at the University of Southern California toward the PhD degree, I was shocked to come across a seven volume work on Old Testament history by the same Edishem. This time I found in volumes one to four that Edishem's chapter, titles, subtitles, and page headings paralleled and were many times almost identical with the chapter titles of Ellen White's Patriarchs and Prophets, 1890. Time and study made it obvious that Mrs. White had obtained liberal help from these additional 
Edith Shame works. Further investigation would reveal that Edith Shame had written also a New Testament history on the life of Christ. And in this too, there were additional similarities with Mrs. White's The Desire of Ages. Although disturbing, these findings were not too upsetting to me at that time, because the White Estate in Washington always seemed to have excuses for Ellen's borrowing. Spectrum, a journal published independently by the Association of Adventist Forums, gave a background account of a January 1980 committee meeting at Glendale, California. This meeting was called by General Conference President Neil C. Wilson. At my urging that consideration be given to the scope of the findings of Ellen White's literary indebtedness, 18 of the church's appointed representatives went on record that what my research showed was alarming in its proportions, but that the study should continue with additional help. Likewise, Spectrum later reported in my dismissal by the church after 36 years of service, primarily because of the disclosure article initiated and written by religious editor John Dart and published in the Los Angeles Times. Not one of the officials doing the firing had ever talked to Dart. Not one had seen the research on which the article was based. The heart of the issue itself was not important to church officials. It was necessary only that someone be punished so that others would stay in line and so that both Ellen White and the Seventh-day Adventist Church would appear to be innocent of any wrongdoing. In view of what I have observed, experienced, and learned, I have thought it proper and necessary to record for future generations the findings of my ongoing study. These coming generations will want to know the truth about what has been unearthed from the past. It will be a part of what they will take into consideration in their religious experience and judgments. Despite much good counsel to the contrary, I have chosen the title The White Life in my book. I do not apply that term separately and only to Ellen G. White. When we, any of us, give our consent or support to perpetuating a myth in whole or in part about any person or anything we ourselves are thereby party to a white line. The message of this book is to help reveal to all of us that often we do indeed carry on a legend. The worst lies that are told are often the ones told in religion because they are told in a way that the assumption is that God endorses them and that therefore they are for our good. That that good can and does become harmful, wrongful, and even evil does not usually occur to those zealous persons who promote legends in the name of God. Another individual who came forth and made his reservations known about what he personally knew about Ellen Goldwhite is William S. Sadler, physician and surgeon, a personal friend of Ellen Goldwhite and son-in-law of John Harvey Kellogg, who was an Adventist founder and inventor. He had this to say. Every now and then, someone arises who attempts to make other people believe in the things which they see or hear in their own minds. Self-styled prophets arise to convince us of the reality of their visions. Odd geniuses appear who tell us of the voices they hear and if they seem fairly sane and socially conventional, in every way, they are sometimes able to build up vast followings, to create cults and establish churches. Whereas if they are too bold in their imaginings, if they see a little too far or hear a little too much, they are promptly seized and quickly lodged safe within the confines of an insane asylum. What was he trying to say? The question now surfaces just how much of these well-known books of Ellen White actually had their origins in the writings of other authors before her time. Ellen White was instructed to give credit for the work she stole. In line with the reviews, honest and open policies that seemed to encourage the readers to practice honesty through the years, 
there were also those who tried to get Ellen to practice that same policy. A June article in the Review, as late as 1980, stated that once Ellen was told how wrong it was to do what she was doing, she told one and all that from that time on, credit should be given to whomever it was due. A reader wrote the review, asking for the date of that remarkable conversation and admission. Here is a reply that the rest of the reading public never had a chance to see. You asked the date when Ellen White gave instruction that the authors of quoted material should be included in footnotes in her writings. The date for this was around 1909. You ask also in what later works this instruction was carried out. The only book that this instruction applied to was The Great Controversy, which was then republished with these footnotes in 1911. There you have it. In 1909, the date given above, Ellen was then 82 years old, six years from the grave. In over 70 years of stealing ideas, words and phrases, never once did she make any attempt to comply to giving others credit for the work she had stolen. Ellen White bears witness against herself that all her writings are her own words given to her by God. Any refusal of her words, the testimonies for the church are a direct rebellion to God. Her nine volume, 4,500 words of instruction and prophecy for the remnant church. However, the evidence was already mounting before the eyes of the senior leadership of the church that she may be deluding herself, but they were not deceived by the same power that held sway over her. Although I am as dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord in writing my views as I am receiving them, yet the words I employ in describing what I have seen are my own. In 1876, she was to say, In ancient times, God spake to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. Placing herself and her writings on an increasingly elevated level, she said in 1882, If you lessen the confidence of God's people in the testimonies he has sent them, you are rebelling against God, as certainly as were Korah, Nathan, and the Byron. These claims had grown with the passing of time until she was able to outdo herself in 1882. When I went to Colorado, I was so burdened for you that in my weaknesses, I wrote many pages to be read at your camp meeting. Weak and trembling, I rose at three o'clock in the morning to write you. God was speaking through clay. You might say that this communication was only a letter. Yes, it was a letter but prompted by the Spirit of God to bring before your minds things that have been shown me in these letters which I write. Night Scenes in the Bible by Reverend Daniel March, published 1870. Testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Then she went on to ask, what voice will you acknowledge as the voice of God? What power has the Lord in reserve to correct your errors and show you your cause as it is? If you refuse to believe until every shadow of uncertainty and every possibility of doubt is removed, you will never believe. The doubt that demands perfect knowledge will never yield to faith. Faith rests upon evidence, not demonstration. The Lord requires us to obey the voice of duty when there are other voices all around us urging us to pursue an opposite cause. It requires earnest attention from us to distinguish the voice that speaks from God. The one problem here was that Daniel March in his book, Night Scenes in the Bible, years before had written the statement you now see on the screen, which was published in 1870. Very close parallels between Ellen White's writings and the book of Yashir, a book mentioned in the Bible, but never a part of it. Francis D. Nichol, 20th century writer, 
reviewing editor and staunch supporter of Ellen, also admitted that she was indebted to Second Esdras, another ancient letter, who was not included in the canon, but was placed on that level by Ellen. Certain of her statements on last day events use some of the terminology and picture language of Esdras and add color, if not authority, to her descriptions. But things were changing in the 1850s and 1860s, despite the help she was receiving from those around her and from the angels that kept checking in and out, she now acquired a new skill that was to set the tone for the rest of her life. Her third grade education notwithstanding, she was known to be reading and subsequent records show that she read and read and read. In 1970s, it came to light that she had been instructed in this art by approximately 500 books and articles in her library and those libraries that were made available to her. Even further advanced light suggests more material was used than known by even the white estate staff and they had been thought to be up on all those things. Also by now, she had learned a more liberalized style of copying, which became known from that time to this as borrowing. Regardless of this type of human help, plus an additional score or more of assistants, book editors, secretaries, and helpers, Ellen White also persisted in saying that it all came from God. Even as early as the second volume of Spiritual Gifts, 1860, Francis D. Nichol, an Adventist review writer, commented on Ellen White's indebtedness to the books of Yashir and Second Esdras. Desmond Ford and Uriah Smith, astute theologians and writers themselves, also knew there were major problems that could not go unnoticed by the conference and the masses for much longer and drastic measures needed to be made in order to save some credibility in Ellen White before the whole Titanic sunk as it were. Desmond was soon dismissed from the Adventist church for his views on Ellen Gold White's prophecies. George Irwin, General Conference Adventist President, 1897 to 1901. Like Smith before him, he wanted to separate at least in his own thinking her testimonies from her visions. But his trial judges and all subsequent review articles were to make clear that it was all or none, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church does indeed believe, as George Irwin had indicated in his 1911 tract, that Ellen was canonized as the divine, infallible interpreter of all Adventist doctrine, and thought the die was cast, or, to put it another way, the Rubicon was crossed, or the bridges were burned behind them. In any case, the Seventh-day Adventist Church stood naked and alone before the world as a cult, believing that salvation is hardly possible and that scripture is indeed impossible as a guide to Christ and the gospel except through Ellen. It is from the standpoint of the light that has come through the spirit of prophecy, Mrs. White's writings, that the question will be considered, believing as we do, that the spirit of prophecy is the only infallible interpreter of Bible principles, since it is Christ through this agency giving the real meaning of his own words. The White Estate Confession Found to have come through quite a few human sources, in the late 1970s, Robert W. Olson for the White Estate, which is always pushed to keep its readers and the church members up to date on such things, issued a rather late concession that Ellen had indeed been peeking at the work of other authors when she wrote The Desire of Ages. Ellen White's indebtedness to other authors has long been acknowledged by Seventh Adventists. The exact extent of Ellen White's borrowings in the Great Controversy is not known. Studies by Raymond Cottrell and Walter Specht have shown that Ellen White borrowed about 2.6% of her words in The Desire of Ages from William Hanna's Life of Christ. However, W.C. White and Marion Davis both mention other books in Christ's life which Ellen White used. It is also evident that she borrowed from some works not named by W.C. White or Miss Davis, such as John Harris, the great teacher. Ellen White's literary borrowing was not limited 
to the three books discussed above. Ellen White can hardly be called a copyist since she almost invariably rewrites, rephrases, and improves on the original author when she does. Neil Wilson, General Conference President, 1979-1990. Even those who might have had their own key to the vault, so to speak, found it fascinating that the shut door might have a possibility of being opened even a little. Donald R. McAdams, himself a competent researcher on Ellen and her writings, sounded a hopeful note over just such prospects in an article in Spectrum, 1980. In the March 20, 1980 Adventist Review, in an article entitled, This I Believe About Ellen G. White, Neil Wilson informed the church about the Ray Blendale Committee. The initial report indicates that in her writing, Ellen White used sources more extensively than we have heretofore been aware of or recognized. The statement is a most significant article to appear in the review in this century. The president of the General Conference is openly and honestly acknowledging the facts that Ellen White's use of sources and pointing the church toward a definition of inspiration that will be new to most Adventists and threatening to some. A full response to Walter Ray must wait until he has presented his evidence to the church in definitive written form. The special Glendale Committee was convened to give the appearance of legitimate investigation, but really it served as a damage control and screening board to protect the church's interests and obscure the truth. The truth that Walter Ray was presenting to the world that the Adventist church's false prophet needed to be held to account as a delusional fraud of the most disingenuous kind. Whitegate Scandal Dr. Don McAdams, SDA Internal Investigation, suppressed by the White Estate. Inevitably, McAdams would react as he did, because he is an honest historian who himself spent much time in 1972-73 to 73 examining a chapter of the Great Controversy, comparing a chapter of it with half a chapter of historian James A. Wiley and finding irrefutable evidence of dependence. The interesting and significant part of this story, as he tells it, is that the White Estate would not allow this church historian to release his work or conclusions to the church or the world. McAdams had another reason to be concerned about what was taking place he was one of the members of the special Glendale committee to whom Wilson wrote. He had seen some of the evidence, had heard the January 28 to 29, 1980 presentation, and had himself stated to his colleagues that the evidence was indeed startling. He had even suggested that if every paragraph in the Great Controversy were footnoted in accordance with proper procedure, almost every paragraph would be footnoted. It is of interest that those committee members present from the White Estate did not challenge him. How could they? They were sitting there with privileged information. Ronald D. Graybill, Assistant Secretary of the White Estate, was present at the meeting. He too had been working in the files and had completed in May 1977 a comparison of Ellen White and her close paraphrasing of a nether historian. Malay d'Orbine, the church hired Adventist scholar Dr. Fred Veltman to examine the desire of ages, and he found 30% or more depending upon the chapter examined. After great expense and almost eight years of research, Veltman confirmed what other studies showed, that depending upon the material used from Mrs. White's writing, the copywork could be as much as 90%. Dr. Veltman noted Implicitly or explicitly, Ellen White and others speaking on her behalf did not admit to and even denied literary dependency on her part. I must admit, at that start, that in my judgment, this is the most serious problem to be faced in connection with Ellen White's literary dependency. It strikes at the heart of her honesty, her integrity, and therefore her trustworthiness. Ministry December 1990, page 11 and page 14. Dr. Don McAdams, an SDA scholar, stated in the 1980 Glendale meeting 
if every paragraph in the book, Great Controversy, written by Ellen White, was properly footnoted, then every paragraph would have to be footnoted. The White estate knew the Great Controversy drew heavily on the work of other historians, rather than on the divine visions of Ellen White. But a popularized version of the Obigné, prepared by the Reverend Charles Adams for young readers, and his, this material had been published first, not in The Great Controversy, but in the October 11, 1883, Signs of the Times article entitled Luther in the Wartburg. The conclusions of this rather simple cloak and dagger story were, as McAdams quotes, Graybill, there does not appear to be any objective historical fact in Mrs. White's account that she could not have gained from the literary sources on which she was drawing, except in one detail. The overall impression gained from this study by this researcher is that it sustains McAdam's main point, that the objective and mundane historical narrative was based on the work of historians, not on visions. Willie White, son of Ellen White, bears witness to the liberty she took. So why didn't we say so in the first place? The nearest that we had ever come to that type of acknowledgement was from son Willie White, letter 4th of November 1912. When writing out the chapters for Great Controversy, she sometimes gave a partial description of an important historical event. And when her copyist, who was preparing the manuscripts for the printer, made inquiry regarding time and place, mother would say that those things are recorded by conscientious historians. Let the dates used by those historians be inserted. William W. Prescott, early Adventist leader, General Conference Vice President 1902, confronted Willie White in a shocking letter dated April 6, 1915. It would be difficult to conclude from these two confidential missives that the people of the Adventist Church are encouraged to know all the truth about Ellen, including her skill in using others' material minus credit lines for her own works. One further bit of information needs to be added to the picture to make it complete. Robert Olson was sitting through the meetings of the Glendale Committee with an ancient but haunting document virtually on his lap. It had been discovered only a few weeks before in the hall of the estate's offices by Desmond Ford in his search for truth. It was so revealing that had Olson read it or used it in the meeting, the session might have been shortened by half a day or more. It came from the pen of W.W. W. Prescott, an earlier longtime leader and former General Conference Vice President of the Adventist Church who turned over some rocks himself. The letter was dated April 6, 1915, and was written to Ellen's son, Willie, with whom Prescott, from the contents of the letter, had worked long and hard. The contents of the letter read as following. It seems to me that a large responsibility rests upon those of us who know that there are serious errors in our authorized books and yet make no special effort to correct them. The people and our average ministers trust us to furnish them with reliable statements, and they use our books as sufficient authority in their sermons. But we let them go on year after year, asserting things which we know to be untrue. I cannot feel that this is right. It seems to me that we are betraying our trust and deceiving the ministers and people. It appears to me that there is much more anxiety to prevent a possible shock to some trustful people than to correct error. Your letter indicates a desire on your part to help me, but I fear that it is a little late. The experience of the last six or eight years and especially the things concerning which I talked with you have had their effect on me in several ways. I have had some hard shocks to get over, and after giving the best of my life to this movement, I have little peace and satisfaction in connection with it. And I am driven to the conclusion that the only thing for me to do is to do quietly 
what I can do conscientiously and leave the others to go on without me. Of course, this is far from a happy ending to my life work, but this seems to be the best adjustment that I am able to make. The way your mother's writings have been handled and the false impression concerning them, which is still fostered among the people, have brought great perplexity and trial to me. It seems to me that what amounts to deception, through probably not intentional, has been practiced in making some of her books, and that no serious effort has been made to disabuse the minds of the people of what was known to be their wrong view concerning her writings. But it is no use to go into these matters. I have talked with you for years about them, but it brings no change. I think, however, that we are drifting toward a crisis, which will come sooner or later, and perhaps sooner, a very strong feeling of reaction has already set in. William W. Prescott, General Conference Vice President, 1902. Letter to Willie White, April 6, 1915. Cottrell was only one of many runners with more bad news for the church in its crisis. Fred Veltman, according to the Adventist Review, in fall 1980, was the man upon whose shoulders the mantle of truth was to visit. Because of the disturbance of the race study, reported the review. After careful examination of the data, it, the Glendale Committee, concluded that Ellen White's use of sources had been more extensive than we had realized and recommended that a scholar trained in literary analysis undertake a thorough going study of the desire of ages. This suggestion was adopted by the General Conference. Already, Dr. Fred Veltman, a New Testament scholar on the faculty of Pacific Union College, is engaged full-time in the project, which is expected to take about two years. There's an old saying, all roads lead to Rome. In an almost bizarre twist to an already unbelievable story, the last place one would ever think the Adventist church would think to turn to for help in defending their infallible prophetess would be the Catholic Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Prexad, which stands for Presidential Executive Advisory Committee, retained a Catholic lawyer to quell the firestorm that was now well and truly out of control. The September 17, 1981 review heralded that their Catholic lawyer had declared that Ellen White was not legally a plagiarist, according to the lawyer's definition, and therefore her works did not constitute copyright infringement. This report, clearly not coming to grips with the moral, spiritual, or theological implications at the heart of the matter, drew very little comfort and brought few sighs of relief from knowledgeable readers. Fanny Bolton was 28 years old when she first met Ellen Goldwhite and would soon impress Ellen to employ her full-time for the next decade as her assistant editor over all her projects. This awarded Miss Bolton exclusive and extremely elevated levels of trust with Ellen White, not to mention an all-areas access of the inner cabal of the activities of the White family. Fanny had rare and deep insight behind the secret machinations of Ellen White. After being tormented by the blatant and flagrant theft of other authors' works that she herself was party to, and then watching it rebranded as her own works in her own name, that of Ellen White, she could not bear the burden of this anguish any longer and began to speak out to others to seek their advice as to how to deal with this problem. Fanny began to speak out to a number of key individuals about this critical situation that she found herself in. And Fanny certainly wanted to bring this crisis to an end. And one of the people that she spoke to was Merritt G. Kellogg of the now well-known Kellogg family. And he wrote about the experience of speaking with Fanny and then speaking with Ellen White. Said Fanny, Dr. Kellogg, I am in great distress of mind. I come to you for advice, for I do not know what to do. I have told Elder Star what I am going to tell you. 
but he gives me no satisfactory advice. You know, said Fanny, that I am writing all the time for Sister White. Most of what I write is published in the Review and Herald as having come from the pen of Sister White and is sent out as having been written by Sister White under inspiration of God. I want to tell you that I am greatly distressed over this matter, for I feel that I am acting a deceptive part. The people are being deceived about the inspiration of what I write. I feel that it is a great wrong, that anything which I write should go out as under Sister White's name, as an article specially inspired of God. What I write should go out over my own signature. Then credit would be given where credit belongs. I gave Miss Bolton the best advice I could, and then soon after asked Sister White to explain the situation to me. I told her just what Fanny had told me. Mrs. White asked me if Fanny told me what I had repeated to her, and my affirming that she did, she said, quote, Elder Star says she came to him with the same thing. Now, said Sister White with some warmth, quote, Fanny Bolton shall never write another line for me. She can hurt me as no other person can, close quote. A few days later, Miss Bolton was sent back to America. From that day to this, my eyes have been open. M.G. Kellogg, the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church reprints the Great Controversy with new footnotes and references in 1911, to which George W. Abaddon, the law defender of Ellen, replied, I know a large share of it was borrowed. What did he mean, borrowed? Maybe he meant that it was all taken, lock, stock, and borrow. Such a hemorrhage of criticism called for major surgery, and it was given 1911 edition of the Great Controversy, though it has been stated over and over again through the years that the reason that it was necessary for the book to be reset was that the electrotype plates were badly worn. Willie White gives another reason for the change of that year. In the body of the book, the most noticeable improvement is the introduction of historical references. In the old edition, over 700 biblical references were given, but in only a few instances were there any historical references to the authorities quoted or referred to. In the new edition, the reader will find more than 400 references to 88 authors and authorities. Now the real shocker. The accusation that Sister White covered her writings with her apron when a visitor came in in order to conceal that fact that she was copying something from a book is truly absurd. It was no secret that she copied choice passages from books and periodicals, but when she was writing counsels and reproof to older ministers, she sometimes desired that it should not be known by younger workers what and to whom she was writing. This often led her to cover her writings when visitors came. What Mrs. Farnsworth revealed, surely, was more than she had intended. What Vesta Farnsworth said about Marion Davis, another of Ellen's editorial assistants, opens up vistas yet to be explored. It is stated that Miss Marion Davis was found one day weeping over the plagiarism in Sister White's books. If this be true, it is one of the many things connected with her work over which she was deeply distressed. Sister Marion Davis was exceedingly faithful and conscientious in her labors and felt keenly her responsibility in the work entrusted to her in connection with Sister White's writings. She was frail of body and often low-spirited. Many times she besought the prayers and the counsel of her associates and fellow workers, and by the help of God, she did a noble work. She loved the work better than her life, and anything which affected it affected her. She had shared in the decision to leave out quotation marks in the early edition of Great Controversy, and to the use of the general acknowledgement in the preface. Then, when there came severe criticism, for this, she with Sister White and her associates 
felt it very keenly. In 1981, the same thoughts of Sadler, but in different words, where he said, the great bulk of her comments deal only with the divine source of her material and tend to deny the influence of human thought and opinion. And thus, while we have no problem with the fact that Mrs. White did borrow, we do wonder why she appears to have denied her borrowing. But denied she did. It is only a part of the extended white lie to say that the church has been open and honest about Ellen's copywork. Neither she nor her husband ever gave evidence that she was in the work of stealing from others. In fact, until forced into admissions in the later years, the whites from James through Willie, the son and aunt to grandson Arthur all took the hard line about Mother Ellen. James's best shot was given in his book, Live Sketches, which was published in 1880, just eight years before the Great Confession. In the introduction of Great Controversy in 1888, it is now clear that Ellen was not original in her writing. Her material was taken from other sources on all subjects in all areas of all books. It is likewise clear that Ellen was indeed substantially influenced by her surroundings her associates and other religious writers from whom she drew, copying, paraphrasing, and the like. The one disclaimer that had been made known in a general way that the introductions of the 1888 and 1911 editions of the Great Controversy does not truthfully deal with the issue. Why would anyone quote from another's published work without intending to cite that person as an authority? It is now being conceded that Ellen had much more help than the church members had been led to believe, and that her helpers did indeed have great latitude in selecting and arranging material and in final editing. Furthermore, in addition to the editorial assistants who are fairly well known, Marion Davis, Clarence C. Chrysler, Doris E. Robinson, Mary Stewart, Fanny Bolton, Mary H. Chrysler, Sarah Peck, Maggie Hare, and H. Camden Lacey, a later release by Willie White, calls attention to others less well known about from 1860 and onward. Some of her manuscripts for publication and some of her testimonies were copied by members of her family. Then he named such copyists as Lucinda Abbey Hall, Adelia Patton, Van Horn, Anna Driscoll, Loughborough, Addie Howe, Cogshaw, Annie Hale Royce, Emma Sturgis Prescott, Mary Cloth Watson, and Mrs. J.L. Ings. There may well have been others. Anna did not have the last word on what was written and did not always have the final say on what was published. Even could it be proved that she was always in control that would not settle the ethical question. It cannot be maintained either in good scholarship or in good conscience that verbal inspiration was the problem with those who saw and understood what was going on. They knew what was going on and did not accept the writings as from God and thus did not condone what was being done. If and when anyone expressed convictions about these matters, that person was served with a personal condemnatory testimony or asked to leave, or even worse, labeled as an enemy of the church and truth. The Adventist church would find it extremely hard to be set free from the deception with words like these from the General Conference president still controlling mindsets 125 years later. It is from the standpoint of the light that has come through the spirit of prophecy, Mrs. White's writings, that the question will be considered believing as we do that the spirit of prophecy is the only infallible interpreter of Bible principles, since it is Christ through this agency giving the real meaning of his own words. Freemasonry and Adventism. The Catholic Church is an insidious institution with many orders that run beneath it. Opus Dei and the Jesuits, just to name a couple. The Jesuits have for a long time been known as a deeply demonic and satanic order of people that are nefarious in their agendas and have infiltrated 
pretty much every institution around the world. In Matthew 7 verse 15, Yeshua warns, Beware of the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Francisco Borgia, third Jesuit superior general, wrote these words, We come, we came in like lambs, and will rule like wolves. We shall be expelled like dogs, and return like eagles. The symbol you see before you is a Latinized version of Jesus, some say in his service, but this is a nefarious order. This is a deeply, deeply demonic order. The three nails at the bottom represent the Hebrew letter Thav, which has the numerical value of six. So what you have here is six, 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 proof that this is a sun worship, Mithra driven, occult institution hiding in plain sight. These gowns worn by these Jesuit priests are known as Jesuit cassocks. So it came as no small surprise when Adventist pastor Samuel Bakayoki turned up at the seminary grounds wearing his Jesuit cassocks. This is the man that has the only book that carries the papal seal of approval charting the history of the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. I personally saw this man teach on this book from my church. The Adventist seminaries have for a long time been infiltrated by Jesuits, and this has been noted by many students within Adventist seminaries. Adventist pastor Charles Taylor Russell, founder of the Watchtower magazine and Jehovah's Witnesses. This is his grave. Why would an ex-Adventist pastor have a pyramid, which is a symbol for Freemasonry, as his gravestone. Charles Taze Russell was born from a Presbyterian family. His father was an elite Freemason. Charles served as an Adventist pastor during his time. He also went on to form the be the founder for the Watchtower magazine and the Jehovah's Witnesses. This begs the question, once a Freemason, always a Freemason. And few ever really renounced their ties to Freemasonry. This is a monument to Charles Taze Russell, noting himself as the Laodicean messenger. In the investigation into Ellen White, the question surfaces, was Ellen White a Freemason? Well, some may think that lodges don't admit women as Freemasons. Not so in America. In America, since its founding, there have been various rites that have been predominantly female, or welcome female amongst their members. Within Freemasonry, there are many hand gestures and symbols and many logos and motifs that literally fill the order. One such gesture is the hidden hand. Here we see the hidden hand is a Masonic symbol. Specifically, it is a sign of the master of the second veil. The note we see here, Ellen White surrounded by noted Adventists, and notice how many of them are sitting, assuming the pose of a master of the second veil, with Ellen White sitting in the midst of them. What you're looking at are the graves of James White, Ellen White's husband, Ellen White's grave, and also William Miller's grave. All three have obelisks as their gravestones. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 3 to 5. And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh the jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes, now the way toward the north, so I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. This is the official statement of the White Estate regarding the obelisks. 
We recently found correspondence relating to this question among the letters of George L. Butler, who was General Conference President when James White died in 1881. And for a number of years after, on February the 12th, 1884, Elder Butler wrote to Mrs. White, the dark colored granite monument at Battle Creek, which you looked at, I ordered for your husband's grave last week at your son Willie's invitation. He told me to have it charged to you. This indicates that Mrs. White had seen the monument chosen and probably W.C. White had seen it too. W.C. White gave Elder Butler approval for its purchase. A letter from Elder Butler to W.C. White on February the 10th of that year discussed the cost of the monument with the headstone and other stones and said that it will be erected as soon as you send on the inscription. It is clear that the White family was involved in the selection of the monument. This image of jealousy is the penis of Nimrod. It is a symbol that represents Freemasonry. It is a symbol that, symbol that represents the all-seeing eye, the spirit of Ra that dwells inside of it, being the spirit of Nimrod being the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of the evil one. This has been a symbol long venerated within Freemasonry, a symbol from ancient Egypt that was supposed to be the symbol of Ra, the spirit of Ra dwelled in this penis. Why would Seventh-day Adventist founders have this symbol of worldwide Freemasonry, a symbol that the Bible calls the symbol of jealousy that provokes the wrath of Yahuwah, why would they have this as their tombstones? You also see this symbol, this capstone on the back of the American dollar. It's a symbol for the New World Order, the Illuminati, the all-seeing eye representing the eye of Horus, the eye of Satan that sees all and controls all things. The question of Ellen White's Masonic connections doesn't stop there. Nathaniel D. Falkhead, 1860 to 1923, who was a New Zealand treasurer and publisher for the Adventist materials out there, had some considerable measure of words to say. Nathaniel was a master mason over several lodges and highly decorated. This meteoric and most unusual rise in lodge ranks would have required him to attend at least nine lodge meetings per month. He was a master mason throughout New Zealand. According to Nathaniel, Ellen White showed advanced knowledge of Masonic secret signs. And I read from his narrative. She spoke most earnestly of the dangers of this connection with Freemasonry warning that unless he severed every tie that bound him to these associations, he would lose his soul. She repeated to him words spoken by her guide, then giving a certain movement with her hands that was made by her guide, she said, I cannot relate all that was given to me. At this, Falkhead started and turned pale, recounting the incident he wrote. Immediately, she gave me the sign. I touched her on the shoulder and asked her if she knew what she had done. She looked up, surprised, and said she did not do anything unusual. I told her that she had given me the sign of a Knight Templar. Well, she did not know anything about it. They talked on. She spoke further of Freemasonry and the impossibility of a man being a Freemason and a wholehearted Christian. Again, she made a certain movement, which my attending angel made to me. Again, Mr. Falkhead started, and the blood left his face. A second time, she had made a secret sign, one known only to the highest order of Masons. It was a sign that no woman could know, for it was held in the strictest secrecy. The place of meeting was guarded both inside and outside against strangers. This convinced me that her testimony was from God, he stated. Speaking further of his reaction to this, he wrote, I can assure you, this caused me to feel 
very queer. But as Sister White said, the Spirit of the Lord had come upon me and taken hold of me. She went on talking and reading as if nothing had happened, but I noticed how her face brightened up when I interrupted her again and spoke to her about the sign. She seemed surprised that she had even given me a sign. She did not know that she had moved her hand. Immediately, the statement that I had made to Brother Stockton that it would have to be mighty strong before I could believe that she had a message for me from the Lord flashed through my mind. When Mrs. White finished reading, tears were in the man's eyes. He said, I accept every word. All of it belongs to me. I accept the light that the Lord has sent me through you. I will act upon it. I am a member of five lodges, and three other lodges are under my control. I transact all their businesses. Now I shall attend no more of their meetings, and shall close my business relations with them as fast as possible. I am so glad you did not send me that testimony, for then it would not have helped me. Your reading the reproof yourself has touched my heart. The Spirit of the Lord has spoken to me through you, and I accept every word you have addressed especially to me. The general matter also is applicable to me. It all means me. That which you have written in regard to my connection with the Freemasons, I accept. I have just taken the highest order in Freemasonry, but I shall sever my connection with them all. When Mr. Falk had left Ellen White's room, I was late. He took the streetcar to the railway station, and while travelling up Collins Street, he passed a large hall. It suddenly dawned upon him that he should have been there attending a Knights Templar encampment that very evening. As he neared the station, he saw the train for Preston pulling out, so he was obliged to walk the rest of the way home. He chose an unfrequented road so that he might have opportunity for meditation. The walk he enjoyed very much, but there had come to him a new experience. He so much wanted to meet Daniels, Starr or W.C. White and tell them that he was a new man and how free and how happy he felt in his decision to sever his connection with all secret societies. It seemed to him that a ton of weight had rolled from his shoulders and to think that the God who rules the universe and guides the planets had seen his danger and sent a message just for him. Another interview with Alan White. On Thursday, December 15th, Mr. Falkhead, accompanied by his wife, had another interview with Mrs. White. A number of pages of new matter were read to the two of them, and it was all accepted. I wish you to know, he told Mrs. White, how I look upon this matter. I regard myself as greatly honored of the Lord. He has seen fit to mention me, and I am not discouraged, but encouraged. I shall follow out the light given me of the Lord. The battle was not certainly won. With the sending of the resignations, his lodge friends refused to release him, so he had to serve out his terms of notice under the nine months. Most determined efforts were put forth to hold him to their society, but he had taken a firm position and stood by it. At times, his church associates trembled for him, Ellen White wrote encouraging letters in support of his stand. He was victorious at last. With the expiration of his term as officer of several of the lodges, the complete victory was won, and Mr. Falkhead was able, on September the 18th, 1893, to write to Ellen White and her son. Dear brother and sister White, it gives me much pleasure to tell you that my term of office as a master of the Masonic Lodge expired last month, and I feel to thank God for it. How thankful I am to him for sending me a warning that I was traveling on the wrong road. I do praise him for his goodness and his love shown toward me in calling me from among that people. I can see now very clearly that to continue with them would have been my downfall, as I must confess that my interest for the truth was growing cold. But thanks be to God, he did not let me go on with them without giving me warning through his servant. I cannot express my gratitude to him for it. I can praise God with all my might, and then I cannot express my gratitude to him for the love that he has shown me. Falkhead remained an active Mason till his sudden death in 1923. While Falkhead subsequently spent many years 
speaking against Freemasonry and was an elder in the Seventh-day Adventist Church right up to his sudden death in 1923. Masonic records document periodic membership in various lodges during the remainder of his life and that he was a member at the time of his death on March 23, 1923. The Masons conducted a funeral service for him according to their rites and rituals following the denominational committal at the cemetery. Mysteriously, while waiting on a railway station platform to board his train home, Nathaniel's life would come to an abrupt end. Did the train die? One would spot the significance of the date uh, connected with his passing away. The 23rd of the third month in 1923, Clearly, the significance of the numbers three and two play a rolling factor in this date of his passing. 32nd degree Freemasonry is considered to be the highest order a master mason can be awarded. But then there are further orders or further levels and degrees that he will ascend to. But the 32nd degree can only be awarded to a master mason. Also, the numbers three and two feature in one of the most nefarious uh, lodges amongst uh, Freemasonry there is in the world. The number of their order being 322. Two. I'm speaking of Skull and Bones, Eugenics, Scientific Racism, and the Adventist Church. But what is eugenics and what is heredity? Heredity is selective and controlled breeding. Famous eugenicists are Bill and Melinda Gates, Oprah Winfrey, Ted Turner, and Klaus Schwab. Eugenics is a scientifically erroneous and immoral theory of racial improvement and planned breeding, which gained popularity during the early 20th century. Eugenicists worldwide believed that they could perfect human beings and eliminate so-called social ills through genetics and heredity. Francis Galton, an English statistician, demographer, and ethnologist and cousin of Charles Darwin coined the term eugenics in 1883. Galton defined eugenics as the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. Galton claimed that health and disease, as well as social and intellectual characteristics, were based upon heredity and the concept of race. During the 1870s and 1880s, discussions of human improvement and the ideology of scientific racism became increasingly common. So-called experts determined individuals and groups of people to be either superior or inferior. They believed biological and behavioral characteristics were fixed and unchangeable and placed individuals, populations, and nations inside of that hierarchy. Francis Galton was a very strong influence on founders of the Adventist Church, especially Kellogg, James, and Ellen White. An interesting foreword at the beginning of Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species tells us and gives us great insight as to the real purpose of his theory of evolution. The true title of the book is The Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle of Life. That is the real motivator behind the work of Charles Darwin and those who would believe in the eugenics agenda. By the 1920s, eugenics had become a global movement there was popular elite and governmental support for eugenics in Germany, in the United States, Great Britain, Italy, Mexico, Canada, and other countries. Statisticians, economists, anthropologists, sociologists, social reformers, geneticists, public health officials, and members of the general public supported eugenics through a variety of academic and popular literature. The most well-known application of eugenics occurred in Nazi Germany in the lead up to the World War II and the Holocaust, the Nazi German racial state, 
between 1933 and 1945, used its resources to cleanse the German people and the Nazi state of those they deemed unworthy of life. Nazis in Germany, Austria, and other occupied territories euthanized at least 70,000 adults and 5,200 children. They implemented a campaign of forced sterilization that claimed at least 400,000 victims. This culminated in the near destruction of the Jewish people, as well as an effort to eliminate other marginalized ethnic minorities, such as the Sinti and Roma, individuals with disabilities and LGBTQ plus people. Louis Pasteur fathered the germ theory of disease, which states that contagious diseases are caused by germs or microorganisms, which are too small to be seen without magnification. Microorganisms that cause disease are called pathogens. Human pathogens include bacteria and virus, among other microscopic entities. He opposed spontaneous generation. The process of pasteurization gets its name from Louis, who invented it. John Harvey Kellogg was a major leader in progressive health reform, particularly in the second phase of the clean living movement. He wrote extensively on science and health. His approach to biologic living combined scientific knowledge with Adventist beliefs, promoting health reform and temperance. His promotion of developing anaphrodisiac foods was based on these beliefs. Many of the vegetarian foods that Kellogg developed and offered his patients were publicly marketed. Kellogg is best known today for the invention of the breakfast cereal cornflakes, originally intended to be an anaphrodisiac made by his brother, Will Keith Kellogg. His creation of the modern breakfast cereal changed the American breakfast cereal landscape forever. As an early proponent of the germ theory of disease, Kellogg was well ahead of his time in relating intestinal flora and the presence of bacteria in the intestines to health and disease. The sanitarium approached treatment in a holistic manner, actively promoting vegetarianism, nutrition, and use of enemas to clear intestinal flora, exercise, sunbathing, and hydrotherapy, as well as the abstention from smoking tobacco, drinking alcoholic beverages, and sexual activity. Kellogg dedicated the last 30 years of his life to promoting eugenics. He co-founded the Race Betterment Foundation, co-organized several national conferences on race betterment and attempted to create a eugenics registry. Alongside discouraging racial mixing, Kellogg was in favor of sterilizing mentally defective persons, promoting a eugenics agenda while working on the Michigan Board of Health and helping to enact authorization to sterilize those deemed mentally defective into state laws during his tenure. Now we begin to see the merging together of different elitist families who are always supporters of eugenics coming together. I said before at the beginning that Louis Pasteur was the father of the germ theory of disease. Now we see Bill Gates forming something called GERM, Global Epidemic Response Mobilization, where Bill Gates will now create an organization whose sole objective is to quickly isolate new viral bacterial threats around the world and have a team dedicated to responding to those threats. And through the World Health Organization, they will control and manage those threats as they appear in real time. Both as a doctor and an Adventist, Kellogg was an advocate of sexual abstinence. As a physician, Kellogg was well aware of the damaging impact of sexually transmissible diseases, such as syphilis, which was incurable before 1910. Kellogg devoted large amounts of his educational and medical work to discouraging sexual activity on the basis of dangers both scientifically understood at the time, 
as in sexually transmissible diseases than those taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Kellogg was an adherent of the teachings of Ellen G. White and Sylvester Graham. Graham, who inspired the creation of the Graham Cracker, advocated keeping the diet plain to prevent sexual arousal. Kellogg's work on diet was influenced by the belief that a plain and healthy diet with only two meals a day would reduce sexual feelings. Those experiencing temptation were to avoid stimulating food and drinks and eat very little meat, if any. The Adventist led Race Betterment Foundation. Kellogg was outspoken about his views on race and his belief in racial segregation, regardless of the fact that he himself raised several black foster children. In 1906, together with Irving Fish and Charles Davenport, Kellogg founded the Race Betterment Foundation, which became a major center of the new eugenics movement in America. Kellogg was in favor of racial segregation in the United States, and he also believed that immigrants and non-whites would damage the white American population gene pool. Even into my own lifetime within the Adventist church, uh, prior to leaving the institution, there were black and white conferences, which Ellen G. White supported the segregating of such people groups, which links back to her prophecies on the Bushmen. Ellen White on the seal of God. The sign or seal of God is revealed in the observance of the seventh day Sabbath, the Lord's memorial of creation. Too late, they say, that the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is the seal of the living God. The seal of the living God is placed upon those who conscientiously keep the Sabbath of the Lord. But the Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us in God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Above we have Philosophy of Wealth, Natural Principles of Health and Cure, by L.B. Coles, published in 1849, in 1851, and 1853. Below we have Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 141, published in 1872. Parents are also under obligation to teach and oblige their children to conform to physical law for their own sakes. How strange and unaccountable that mothers should love their children so tenderly as to indulge them in what they have occasion to know may injure their constitutions and impair their happiness for life. May many children be delivered from such mothers and from such cruel kindness, the managers and teachers of schools. I was shown that one great cause of the existing deplorable state of things is that parents do not feel under obligation to bring up their children to conform to physical law. Mothers love their children with an idolatrous love and indulge their appetite when they know that it will injure their health and thereby bring upon them disease and unhappiness. They have sinned against heaven and against their children, and God will hold them accountable, the managers and teachers of schools. False teachings within the SDA church. It is taught that the scapegoat that carried the sins of the people of Israel away on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, does not represent Yeshua HaMashiach, but actually represents Hasatan. It is taught that in the end, the sins of the truly repentant will be placed on Satan. It was seen also that while the sin offering pointed to Messiah as a sacrifice, and the high priest represented Messiah as a mediator, the scapegoat typified Satan, the author of sin, upon whom the sins of the truly penitent will finally be placed. Their sins are transferred to the originator of sin. 
The word of God is very clear that God laid our sins on Yeshua HaMashiach and no other. They believe in the sanctuary teaching that Yeshua is now cleaning the sanctuary in the heavens before he can return to earth. Instead of coming to the earth at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, Christ had entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of atonement preparatory to his coming. This is a man-made doctrine, not in the Bible. They believe in the final and total annihilation of the wicked, where they will simply cease to exist after the final judgment. This doctrine is in harmony with Jehovah's Witnesses. The Bible says the wicked will be cast into the lake of fire and their punishment is forever. They do not believe in the eternal punishment of Hasatan and his fallen angels. They believe the penalty for sinning against the Most High is merely annihilation. Hasatan is the scapegoat. The sins of the believers are laid upon him and he and these sins are finally burned up. All this is unbiblical. The Bible says that Hasatan and his fallen angels will be cast into the lake of fire. Furthermore, Yeshua is the fulfillment of both goats, both the one unto Yahuwah and the goat unto Azazel. Yeshua fulfills the role of all the sacrificial offerings and the uh, LMG White taught that all other churches except the SDA church were teaching lies from the devil. Only SDA members are true and obedient believers. Prayers spoken in other churches are only answered by the devil. This is the teaching of a cult. They believe that in the last days, just before Christ returns, only those worshipping on Saturday will be saved. They particularly believe that worshipping on Sunday will be the mark of the beast. They consider themselves to be the only true remnant church and all others will be condemned in time. This is a false teaching. The mark of the beast will be a mark either in your forehead or in your hand. Revelation 14 verse 9. They firmly believe that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Archangel Michael, and this is the name used for him in the Bible. Yet they also believe that Yeshua is God. Yeshua is God, and all things were created by him, whereas Michael is an archangel. They believe you should revere their founding prophetess, Ellen G. White, viewing her as having the spirit of prophecy referred to in the book of Revelation. Ellen G. White's writings are considered as inspired as the Bible and are used as an authoritative source of truth. The following is an official statement of the SDA General Assembly held in 2015. Quote, we reaffirm our conviction that her writings are divinely inspired. We commit ourselves to study the writings of Ellen G. White with hearts willing to follow the counsels and instructions we find there. Adventist.org Articles, July 7, 2015. The claim that a person's writings are as inspired as the Bible is deception. The early Adventists expected the literal second coming of Christ in 1843 and 1844, but they were disappointed. They won't tell you that their 1844 investigative judgment teaching was born out of an attempt to cover over this false prophecy. Instead of repenting over this false date, they believe that Christ really came but invisibly, in heaven. As an SDA, you now enter a period of investigative judgment where every deed you do or don't do is recorded for judgment day. You will even be judged for idle moments where you could have been more obedient. These revelations, teachings, are all deception. So now we have it, finally, the real truth of the white lie. But as though the drama I have unfolded for you was not quite enough, there is yet more. After Walter Ray published his book, The White Lie, in 1982, which demonstrated her massive plagiarism, the denominational leaders appointed Dr. Fred Veltman to do an in-depth study of the Desire of Ages, said to be Ellen White's best book. To determine if Ray's work was accurate, Dr. Veltman took eight years researching this book, comparing it to many, but not all, of the books that were the sources of her statements. Ministry Magazine reported on the Veltman Report upon its completion. The official Veltman Report frankly concluded 
that not only had Ellen White ferociously copied the works of other writers, but both she and her co-workers had deliberately lied to cover up the truth of her copying, or should we say borrowing. Here are two of the conclusions of the development report. It is of first importance to note that Ellen White herself, not her literary assistants, composed the basic content of the Desire of Ages text. In doing so, she was the one who took literary expressions from the works of other authors without giving them credit as her sources. Second, it should be recognized Ellen White used the writings of others consciously and intentionally, implicitly or explicitly. Ellen White and others speaking on her behalf did not admit to and even denied literary dependency on her part. Here is Dr. Veltman's personal conclusion regarding the integrity of Ellen White. I must admit at the start that in my judgment, this is the most serious problem to be faced in connection with Ellen White's literary dependency. It strikes at the heart of her honesty, her integrity, and therefore her trustworthiness. Pastor Walter T. Ray, Sunrise, 12th of June, 1922. Sunset, 30th of August, 2014. I wish to acknowledge by giving all credit and my deepest thanks to Pastor Walter T. Ray for all the information I have presented here today stands upon his shoulders. I bless Yahuwah El Shaddai for your life and for your service to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and for your incomparable work, which records for all future generations of Adventists the real truth about the white lie. Luke chapter 12, verse two to three. There is nothing covered up that will not be uncovered or hidden that will not become known. What you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed on the housetops. <laughs>